Amen. How many of y'all have been enjoying this series called to serve? How many of y'all feel like you understand your purpose a little bit better? Amen. So we are um, in the finale. We're in the finale of this uh, teaching series. And so my goal today is to try to tie all of this together for you and to seal it up with a nice bow. Amen. And so real quickly, um, you guys can take your seats. I'm just going to talk for a little bit. Um, last week, we, we covered um, the subject, I get to serve. Remember that? How many of y'all were here last week? Um, we learned that it's a privilege to serve. Amen. Serving is our response to God's love for us. And um, some of us, you know, we, we, we disqualify ourselves before we even give ourselves the opportunity sometimes because we feel like we're not qualified to serve the kingdom. You know, I'm not as spiritual as somebody else. I'm not, I don't pray like this person does and I don't get it right all the time. But let me tell you something. If you are in here today and you have breath in your body and you have blood running warm in your veins, God can use you. Yes, even in the condition you are now. We are all under construction. Tell somebody we're all under construction. And so please don't feel that because you haven't arrived to a certain place of grace that God cannot use you. And it's amazing how, like I said, God will oftentimes pour out his love on you even in seasons where you're like, I ain't even thinking about God. And he does it intentionally. How many of y'all have ever experienced God move through you even in your sin? Like what? I just said that? I just encouraged somebody? Because God wants to remind you that he has a plan for your life. God is so crazy about you. He will go through heights and depths to chase you down. And some of you all had to take a Jonah experience for you to wake up and be like, you know what? God really loves me that much. Amen. And so last week we talked about the characteristics of a servant's heart. We learned that number one, true servants thrive in unity. Somebody say unity. We learned that true servants walk in humility. Somebody say humility. And then number three, we learned that true servants are willing to be inconvenienced for the benefit of someone else. Amen. Jesus' entire life was devoted to being inconvenient so that somebody else could be blessed as a result of it. And so sometimes we just have to pause through life and, and just open our eyes to see the needs of everyone else around us. And sometimes, you know, we go through life and we feel like, well, I got so much going on right now that you are blinded by your own issues. But I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes you feel like in those moments you have nothing to give anybody else. But if you open your eyes and just be aware of what's around you, the, the blessing that comes as a result of serving someone else, even when you're going through your own issues, God allows you to see that my issues ain't even as bad as I thought they were. Has that ever happened to you before? Like, I, I thought I had it bad, but it really isn't as bad as it seems. And so uh, we, at the end of the day, our goal through this teaching is to help you get a better grip and understanding on what God has called you to do and that you can put your hand to the plow and be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Is that okay? Amen. So let's go this morning. We're going to, to, going to go to the gospel of Luke uh, chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We're going to re be reading verses 25 through 30. Luke 14, <coughs> 25 through 30. We're going to be reading from the... New Living Translation for the sake of teaching today. The Bible reads, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of, construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. 
they would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Today, I'm going to be teaching from the subject, count the cost. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, count the cost. Count the cost. Um, The reality of it is um, those of us that have been called by God and you know there is an assignment on your life. You may not even know what it is yet, but you know there's a nudging on the inside of you that there's something more that God has for you and he wants you to do. For the majority of us in here, it took a wrestle to get a yes out of us. Come on, let's be honest. We didn't willingly give God a yes when he first called us because there's all of the what ifs, there's the fears, there's the, do I lose, who, what do I lose in the process? How many of y'all have ever felt like, what do I got to give up? I don't want to lose my identity. Let me tell you something. Your identity is in him in the first place. And so anything that you lose, God will replace with better. Somebody say better. Um, but the, the, the honest truth is it took a lot of us, some of us, to have a head-on collision with destiny before we finally raised the, wet, the white flag to say, okay, God, I give you permission in my life. For some of us, it took some situations to knock us down and hit rock bottom before we actually said, okay, God, I, I surrender. Some of us, like Jonah, had to be swallowed up in the belly of a whale. And some of you may not figure to been, may not have uh, uh, naturally been swallowed up in a whale, but you've been swallowed up in situations that you did not know how you were going to get out. And you had no other choice but to say, help. Some of us, God had, was so passionate about pursuing us, he literally had to corner us in in order for us to look up to him. And the, the reality is, I, I honestly, y'all, I get nervous about all of these people who are chasing mantles, chasing platforms, chasing titles, chasing positions. I get nervous, this new day and age people that actually go after positions in leadership and accolades and, you know, all these pop-up prophets and apostles on social media. They are gleaning a, 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 and heaping people to themselves, not because they want God to get the glory, but because they want to they platform them own, their own selves. And so I get, I get nervous when people get saved and they run straight to wanting to uh, obtain a title or a position in leadership. It makes me nervous. Can I help you understand why? Because anyone who has really counted the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Christ, anyone who has ever counted the cost and looked at what it's going to cost me if I pursue this thing, they understand there's a weight of responsibility that comes along with this thing. There's a weight of responsibility. There are souls connected to your yes. There are souls connected to your obedience. And so... When you understand the cost and the weight of the responsibility, you're not quick to raise your hand. Most of you all, you had to be pulled into this thing. Most of you all, we had to uh, say, come on, come on, come off the back burner. Come off the back row. There's more in you that needs to come out. When you understand the cost of your yes, you understand the magnitude of the warfare that's assigned to you. (laughs) because here's the reality the enemy knows that if you ever come into your full potential if you understand who you really are and what God has called you to do the kingdom of darkness you are a threat to his kingdom when you ever step into the fullness of the power that lives on the inside of you. It's not you, it's the power on the inside of you. The Bible lets us know that you have power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, that nothing can hurt you. See, the enemy has a big roar, but he ain't got got no teeth. And some of us are intimidated by the devil, but the devil has no permission in your life unless you grant him access. And so the enemy knows 
When you say yes to God, and see, I believe that the, the devil is, has the ability to tap over into your future because he realizes if you come into your full potential, he better watch out because you know how, now how to slap back at the enemy and you know how to pray and travail on behalf of your family, for your bloodline, for the people that are connected to you. And as you come out in your full deliverance, you're bringing a whole bunch of people with you. See, the enemy is okay with you as long as you stay in bondage. As long as you keep dabbling in sin, as long as you keep kind of hiding in the back burner, as long as you keep pl uh, playing the gray line. And, and, and God said, if you, if you live in gray, I can't do nothing with you. I want you to be, either be hot or be cold. And if you in the middle, I, I'm going to spew you out of my, I can't do nothing with that. And so when you get on fire for God, some people get so excited and they feel the presence of God and they get excited because they wake up in the morning. Y'all remember when you, when you first got saved, that moment where you just felt like I was on top of the world, but all of a sudden all hell broke loose in your life? Trial after trial, test after test, situation after situation to the point you're like, can I just catch my breath? But can I help you with something? All of that was necessary for where God is trying to take you. God is trying to equip in you a stability, a foundation because the place that he's elevating you to is going to require your character to match your gift. And it's through the process of life that really goes to show what you're made of. If you can stand through the tests and the challenges of life, then you pass the test that, okay, I can use you. And so today we're going to talk about three things. I'm going to let y'all go home and get brunch. <laughs> we're going to talk about three things, uh, understanding the cost of your yes. Number one, when we consider the cost of following Christ and serving in his kingdom, number one, you have to resolve your yes to God. You have to resolve your yes to God. And here's the reality. If you don't resolve your yes to God, you will look unstable to man. <laughs> People cannot follow instability. They can't. One day, one day you're on fire. The next minute, you want to go hide in a cave. <sighs> one minute, you're ready to preach to the nations. The next minute, you don't want to talk to nobody. Tell somebody, God, people can't follow instability. If every year after you have stepped out and you've pursued this thing, if every, every year you say, I'm ready to quit and give up and throw in the towel, Every six months, tell somebody, you got to resolve your yes. And here, here's, the, here's the, the truth of the matter. When we give God our yes, there is a death sentence to ourself. There's a death sentence to ourselves. And oftentimes, we want to give God a yes with stipulations. God, I'll serve you, but... God, I'll do this, however. God, I'll do that, but I want to keep this part of me. When you give God an authentic yes, it requires a thousand percent faith. Y'all hear me? Because oftentimes we think when we say yes to God, everything is just automatically going to align up in our lives. We think things are just going to magically fall into place. I said yes to God. I'm serving him now. Everything's about to turn around. Come on, tap your neighbor and say, turn around three times, it's going to happen. I wish I could tell you that was true. And please hear me, God is a miracle worker. He is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. But guess what? He's not going to respond to a demand that you place on him that does not align with his will. You can make your request known to God, but if it doesn't align up with his will, it's not going to happen. And sometimes our view of God 
is not accurate. And we get frustrated because we feel like God is supposed to just respond to our request. But see, that's why we got the Holy Ghost. Why, well, why you need the Holy Ghost. <sighs> Let me rephrase. Because the Holy Ghost will help you understand when you're praying in your flesh, the Holy Ghost will take over and start allowing you to speak in an unknown language. You don't know what you're praying, but guess what? You're praying the will of the Father. And so many times we go to God in our flesh saying, God, I want this, I want that, do this, do that. Fix that, fix him, fix her, do that, avenge my enemy. (laughs) And so we have to have an understanding that trials are going to come. But guess what? They're not going to last always, right? He will see us through every low season, every valley season, every obscure season. And you have to trust that the same God that was with you on the mountaintop is the same God that's going to see you through that valley. The same God that gave you that promotion is the same God that's with you when you got demoted. The same God that was with you when you got married on that, on that wonderful wedding day with that beautiful dress and all those people watching is the same God that's going to be walk with you through the trials of life in your marriage. Tell somebody the same God. So our yes to God has to be resolved. If we are wishy-washy with, with our yes, we're not ready. The Bible says, no man putting his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom. You got to make sure that when your hand goes to that plow, it's not letting go. Hey, woo! you got to make sure that you have a made up mind that when you are ready to go forth in this thing, that you know what? I'm going forward in this thing with God. I'm looking behind. I'm not looking behind. The former things are gone. There's nothing in my past that that is, is enticing to me anymore. I'm ready to let go everything that I held on onto, everything that held me in bondage, everything that was comfortable to me. Everything that I felt security in. See, it's, it, your yes is very uncomfortable because oftentimes God doesn't show you what's ahead. God, I always say this, God knows what we can handle. <laughs> God will show us in part. He'll show us bits and pieces of the vision, bits and pieces of what he's called you to do, bits and pieces of the, of the outcome, but he don't show you the middle. He don't show you the process. And a lot of times we blame the enemy. We rebuking the enemy for warfare in our lives. And it's not the enemy. It's God's process in your life. You can't carry some of the things that are on the inside of you into your next season. There's there's tendencies, there's there's parts of us that we have to be willing to give to God in order to ensure that we are fit for the kingdom of God. Not that we'll ever be perfect, but we what? Strive for perfection. Tell somebody, resolve your yes. Preach, son. Number two, when counting the cost, we must resolve our purpose from God. Resolve your purpose from God. My sincerest desire for each of you is that you have an ability to navigate and understand exactly what it is that God has called you to do in the earth. Somebody say you. Each of you got us placed inside of you gifts, talents, and abilities not to bring glory to yourself, not for self-promotion, Not so that you can be puffed up and glamorous. Not so that you can get the accolades of man. But God has placed gifts on the inside of you to bring glory to him. To build his kingdom. Every single one of you, God has deposited treasures on the inside of you that he is waiting to unearth. And so in order to unearth those things, we got to first resolve our yes to him. And then secondly, we got to resolve our purpose to him. And oftentimes we don't know what our purpose is because we keep looking at somebody else's life and thinking we're just going to mimic that. You know, especially the day, day and age of social media, you know, we see what everybody else is doing and we just want to copy and paste. 
God is not in the business of copy and pasting when you are, are an original. There is an authenticity of grace on your life to do something specific in the earth. And guess what? It doesn't have to be grand. If you have the gift of cleanliness, I want you to come in here and vacuum this carpet like it's, it's the last thing you got to do in this earth. Go get your uh, Mr. Clean and get them toilets and get that brush. I'm going to tell y'all something. Wave your hand, Heather. I love watching Heather clean this church because she's just dancing around. She's having the time of her life. You can tell she's putting her heart and soul into that thing. And so many times we categorize opportunities. And if it doesn't look like I'm going to get a platform or attention, I'm going to do it half-hearted. But can you do it wholeheartedly with nobody looking, when nobody sees you? Find what it is that God has called you to do and stay in your lane. See, when you're driving a car, it's important that you stay in the right lane. Because the moment you begin to swerve, you now put yourself in danger of being hit by another vehicle. You have to stay in the lane that God has designed for your life. And so many times we hit a brick wall because we are pushing for success in the wrong lane. We're pushing for success. We're pushing to do things that God never called us to do, but we're, we're seeking affirmation and things that... God has never designed us to do. And so we get frustrated with God because God is not allowing you to go forth and not allowing the manifestation of what you thought you saw in your head. But you have to ask yourself, was that vision from God? Or is that vision from somewhere else that I saw? So we have to resolve what it is that God has called us to do. Colossians 3 and 23 says, and whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it with all your heart. As unto the Lord, not unto men. Everything that we do in this earth is not meant to be seen by people. And if you're striving to be seen, God will hide you on purpose. He will literally hide you on purpose until you get your motives right. God's more concerned about the issue of our heart than our gift. We've been saying this a lot and y'all are probably tired of hearing this, but I need you to get it. I don't care about your gift. What is the condition of your heart? What is your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? What's your motive? What's your intentions? What are you trying to get out of this? He said, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Anything that God has called you to do, I don't care if it's the smallest assignment. Do it with passion. Do it with zeal. I believe that Christians, we should be excellent in everything that we do. Everything that we go do has the footprint of God on it. It should be a reflection of excellence. Is that okay? Why? Because we are re representing an excellent God. And so number one, when we are counting the cost, we have to resolve our yes to him. Number two, we have to resolve our purpose from him. What is it that he's calling you to do? And number three, then we have to build the proper infrastructure for our lives. Bible says faith without works is dead. Just because God showed you something and he called you to do something doesn't, ma doesn't mean magically everything's just going to fall in place and it's just going to happen just like that. Tell somebody you got to do the work. If God's given you a vision, see we got a lot of zealous people with good intention but poor planning and execution. And so I'll tell y'all, when I was growing up, my father was a contractor. And I, he oftentimes would take me on jobs with him. And um, I had to watch this process that he would go through of building an entire house from the ground up. 
And for the first step was he would meet with the client to understand what they wanted. And then they would look at blueprints and decide which blueprint they were gonna go with. Then the next step was he had to write up what was called an estimate. He had to figure out how many nails it was gonna take, how many, how many beams it was gonna take, what was gonna be needed here, what this room was gonna look like, what was all of the pieces and the components to make sure this house was built in its entirety with nothing missing. Because if you know anything about building a house, if, if there is a part of the house that's not built properly, it could be a danger to the house. And especially the foundation, if the foundation is not built correctly, the house could eventually crumble. There's something called, um, where's my contractors at? What's them walls called that hold the roof up? Huh, well, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about? It's called something. I need y'all to help me preach today. Pastor Smallwood, what's it called? Load-bearing wall. Thank you, Joseph. There's something called load-bearing walls. And if you attempt to move a load-bearing wall and in the wrong place, the roof will eventually sink in because that that type of wall is meant to be in place to hold up the infrastructure of the home. And so he had to go through all this to figure out what do I need? I got to do an estimate. Then after the estimate, he had to present the estimate to the client. The client then had to put a down payment on the house, on the building. There had to be an exchange before the project was started. I'm teaching. A down payment had to be made prior to him starting the work of the building. Once the down payment was made, then he went forth to build the entire house. Contractors have to see the end of the thing before they even start. And so many times we are zealous because God shows us something and we run straight to execution and we haven't thought out a single plan. God is more interested in long-term stability than short-term success. And sometimes I've had to tell some of y'all in here right now, zealous and ready to go for it. And I love it. I'm so glad you are excited about serving God and doing things for the kingdom. But there are times I've had to tell some of you, you're not ready. Why? Because the infrastructure of your life does not reflect being able to support where you say God has taken you. You've got to build an infrastructure to your life that reflects and supports what you say God wants to do in your life. Because I'm going to tell you something, if you go before God without building the infrastructure first, you will crumble under pressure. You won't be able to handle the weight of the assignment. And so we have to do our due diligence to make sure that we build the proper infrastructure to our life so that we can support the weight of the assignment of God. Tell somebody to build the proper infrastructure. I'm going to close with this. As we are counting the cost to the assignment of God, your yes to God, your service to God. God spoke to me yesterday morning. He said, count the cost, but don't look too long. Count the cost, but don't look too long. In other words, make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into, but don't look so long that you talk yourself out of it. Because if we be honest, have you ever looked at the responsibilities on your plate and you got overwhelmed? (laughs) I tried to sit down and do a mind map the other day of everything that I do and I was like, what? Sometimes we can get overwhelmed by the, the, the plan, the vision, the assignment of God over our lives. But God wants me to tell you today, don't look too long. Some of you have talked yourselves out of some of the greatest moments of your life because you looked too long. You studied it too hard. And let me help you with something. There is an element to this thing that is not 
going to require your intelligence. It's not going to require your wisdom. It's not going to require how wonderful you are to execute it. But it's going to require the faith in God to do what he said he was going to do. There's going to be times where you do all your due diligence to have the plan in place to present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. You're going to have all your T's crossed and all your I's dotted, but it's still not going to make sense. Why? Because God is going to breathe on it when you trust that he has the ability to do it. There's a part to this thing that you cannot control. And when you try to control your own destiny, you will never make it to your destination. Y'all heard me say this not too long ago, but where there is a presence of control, there's an absence of faith. You have to be willing, once you've done all that you are assigned to do, to rest in the promises of God. When it doesn't look like it's happening, rest in his promises. When you don't know how the way is going to be made, rest in his promises. When you don't know where the clients are coming from, rest in his promises. When you don't know who's going to buy your book, rest in his promises. We have to get to a place that as we count the cost of following him, that there's a faith factor that we don't miss out on. God is taking us to higher heights and deeper depths. And there is, the Bible says, faith without works is dead. And faith is the sums of things hoped for. We sang it earlier. It's the evidence of things that's not seen. And sometimes the fact that you don't see it doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. The fact that you doesn't, don't see it means it's a great opportunity for God to show up on your behalf. <laughs> there is situations that God will put you in to squeeze you. To understand where your heart is. Will you trust me in this? And when the heavens are shut up and it feels like God is no longer speaking, walk out the last thing that he told you. See, sometimes we get so hungry for another word. God, give me direction. God, give me direction. God, give me direction. Did you do the last thing he told you? Are you resting in the promise that the the last thing that he said? We have to get to a place where we are, we are literally water walking and trusting the plan of God for our lives. Tell somebody to count the cost. <laughs>